Indeed, we are the church, we are the bride of Christ, and we continue to walk through the book of Acts. This morning, we are in Acts chapter 4. In your pew Bible, that's page 1083, 1083, and I would ask you to, to join me there this morning. Also, if you're a guest this morning, if you have been looking for a place to faithfully pursue Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, as pastors, we'd love to spend some time with you at 10 o'clock. We're going to meet right over here on the south side of the sanctuary and uh, make, make the time, stay, and uh, bring your questions to us. With God's word open, let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we want to speak the name of Jesus also. We want to be your faithful sons and daughters, co-heirs of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Not simply purchased and redeemed for eternity, but called and appointed as long as there is time to share Jesus one relationship at a time, even when it's difficult and especially when it's challenging. Help us to know what it means to give a faithful response. Show us again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So someone disagrees with you, not just a little bit, but a lot. They get right in your face and they tell you that you're wrong. They get right in your face and they tell you that you're the one who needs to shut up. You're the one who needs to be quiet. How are you doing? They begin saying things about you to other people, the argument now rings out. Immediately, they're texting and they're sharing and they're promoting their side of the story while simultaneously, intentionally misquoting and misrepresenting you and what you may have said or not said, what you may have done or, or not done. How are you doing? Emotionally, they get right in your face, making up statements that they know are lies. But they don't care. One singular purpose drives them to hurt you, to make it stick, in order to make themselves feel better. How are you doing? How does it feel when such a bully shows up attacking you? You're in their crosshairs. So what happens when the world is the bully and the church, the bride of Christ, is the target? What happens when the, the world is the bully and as a faithful follower of Jesus, you are attacked. You are persecuted. You're given a black eye. What do you do in that moment? How do you respond when the gospel isn't simply ignored? The gospel isn't simply rejected. But the gospel and you together are fought adamantly against? Do you quit like a coward, sulk, pout, and walk away? Do you get loud? Do you get emotional? Do you get angry? And do you go after venom with venom? Or is there another way? When the bullies of this world come against the gospel of Jesus. How should you, how should I, how should we respond? Peter and John have already delivered a powerful message. You have heard it over the last couple of weeks. They have invited people to Jesus. They've 
called them out in their sins. They've extended the invitation to, to repent, to walk away from that old life and to live life with Jesus as Savior and Lord. They've invited a man who's been paralyzed from birth, now 40 years old, to, to stand up and walk. They've been teaching on Solomon's porch. All of this has been transpiring. And now the world is showing up bullishly to attack the gospel, to attack Jesus. Their intent is to, is to shut down this phenomenon. Their intent is to discredit the good news. Their intent is to, to finally put an end to Jesus. But these are the bullies that Jesus died to save. Say that with me. These are the bullies that Jesus died to save. So how do we respond? Church, this is why our response matters. When we are attacked, we need to understand the attack is not against us. When the attack comes, it's not about you or me trying to protect ourselves and our own perceived rights. When the attacks come, when the persecution comes, when the statements are made, when we are told literally to shut up, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Say that with me. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. These are the bullies that Jesus died to save. And so running away like a coward and sulking in the corner is, is not a proper response, nor is getting emotionally angry and mad and shouting right into their faces a proper response. Especially when the attacks come. We need to know how to respond in order that we may continue to share Jesus one relationship at a time. So listen, as the church is attacked for the first time, but not the last. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, that's Peter and John, and as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. When, not if, when we are attacked, when we are bullied, when we bring the good news only to receive a black eye, how should we respond? Looking at chapter four this morning, guess how many points there are for us this morning to enjoy? Seven. Aren't you excited? Okay, don't check out yet. We're going to be moving fast, okay? So here we go. How do you respond when, when a bully brings a black eye against the gospel? Number one, be willing to submit. To do what, church? To submit. When the attack against the gospel surrounds you and encircles you, accept it and be willing to submit to the opportunity that God has just created. Look down there at verse 5 in your Bibles. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? So Peter and John, they have been, uh, they have been, 
captured. They have been detained and jailed for the night. They are now in the midst of all these important people. They are encircled by this audience of bullies. Look what God has done. God is the one who has created this opportunity. God has actually brought all of the bullies together. And in the midst, in the middle of the bullies, here is Peter and John. Now, should they just cowardishly try to sneak away and, and avoid a suspected attack? Should they just get loud and, and angry and emotional and let their feelings be in control? Or should they submit themselves to the opportunity at hand. God's created this opportunity. You see, sometimes we're so focused on the attack, we get so angry at what someone has said to us that we miss the opportunity that we're in the middle of. Peter and John submitted themselves to the opportunity at hand. Are you willing to do that? When you're surrounded on all sides, are you going to think about yourself or are you going to think about Jesus? Are you going to think about how to get out of there? Or are you going to, are you going to say, God, I'm willing right here, right now, I'm going to submit myself and I'm going to share Jesus. You've created this opportunity and I'm not going to miss it. Number one, every response must be one of submission. When we are responding to the bullies against the gospel, we also need to be, number two, spirit-filled. Say that with me. Spirit-filled. Have you ever said something without thinking about it first? Anybody here? If your hand's not up, check with the person next to you. <laughs> we have all said something without thinking first. At times, our mouth runs in, in high gear with, without being engaged it, to our minds. Our feelings, our emotions, our desire to defend ourselves takes over. And we just run off at the mouth before saying anything. Before speaking a single word in response. Peter quarantines his feelings. He quarantines his emotions. He quarantines his own agenda. And he entrusts himself to the Spirit of God. You see verse 8. Then Peter, read the next part with me. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. He wasn't going to say anything without being dependent upon the Spirit of God, without referring to the Spirit of God, the leading and the prompting and the filtering of, of the Spirit of God, because it's always about the gospel. We're not trying to defend ourselves. We're trying to bring the answer of the gospel. We're trying to, to show and to share why Jesus is so beautiful. Why Jesus is the loving response and gift of God as Savior and Lord. That's why it's not about our own words. It's not about how we would do this, but it's, it's how the, the Spirit would fill and lead and guide and direct our words. If we're going to give any response, it must be spirit-filled. Not personally or emotionally or vindictively driven. Of course, if you're going to give a response to those who are currently bullish against the gospel... You need to be ready to, you need to be prepared to, number three, share. Say it with me, to share. Even when your message is ridiculed or belittled, 
Are you still properly, are you still well prepared to share Jesus? If you were in that circle with Peter and John, if you were surrounded on, on all sides by those who are questioning and those who are attacking and those who are thinking there's no way that gospel has any good news for me, if you were in the midst of that God-created audience, would you know how to rightly share Jesus? You see, in that moment, you're not sharing to invite someone to a worship service. The moment is then and there. The moment is then and there to, to share Jesus clearly. Can we do that this morning? Is every single one of us, some of us are only 10 years old, some of us are 80, some of us are in that muddy middle. After all of these years, how many of us are able to, to clearly Share Jesus. Peter in this moment at verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we, we must be saved." Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. You see, in that moment, Peter and John, they're prepared, they're ready they are able and capable by the power of the Holy Spirit to share Jesus. They share that in the name of, of Jesus, there is power. They share that, that Jesus was crucified. Jesus was put to death, no doubt about it. And yet three days later, he rose again from the dead by the command and the power of God Almighty. Amen, church? They shared in that moment that there is only one through whom salvation can be received, the forgiveness of sins. Peter and John were able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is so beautiful? They're everyday, ordinary individuals. Scripture calls them common. Scripture calls them uneducated it wasn't by their own strength or ability. It wasn't by the influence or the education of this world that they were able to, to share Jesus one relationship at a time. It was by the power of the Holy Spirit and their dedication and their commitment to God, to the study of God's word that they were able and ready to share. Can you, can I share Jesus today in that moment? in that opportunity. If you can't yet, don't be ashamed of that. Don't be worried about that. But don't sit quietly on that. Ask us for help. We would love for you to ask for help. That's why we have intentional groups. That's why we're committed to growing in our faith. We love to worship, we love to serve, but we love to grow in our faith and our knowledge and understanding of scripture and then how it applies to our lives and to the lives of others. Our groups, our studies are moving intentionally in this direction to ready and prepare all of us to share Jesus. Because if we can't share Jesus. 
what do we have to give this world? And what more are we than a simple group of people only interested in ourselves? Our response must be one where we are ready to share. Number four, when we respond, we must be willing to sacrifice. Say that with me, to sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed. Jesus was not only willing, but Jesus gave it all. He laid down his life for the forgiveness of our sins. Today, Christians, many Christians, aren't even willing to be inconvenienced. They're not willing to be embarrassed. They're afraid they might lose a friendship. They're afraid they, they might be labeled as actually being a Christian. Wow. The Christian church today is not in the habit of being willing to personally sacrifice. What are we willing to give up for the name of Jesus? Were Peter and John willing to give anything up? Look at verse 14. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred, the council conferred with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Wow, what a geezer, right? <laughs> I must be ancient. They have been warned. They've been detained. They've been jailed. They've been charged. Scripture tells us that they have been threatened. Peter and John don't know how this is going to go. They don't know if they're going to be released or not. And yet they say, you know what? You decide. If you think you're in charge, fine. We obviously believe that God is in charge. You want us to stop speaking the name of Jesus? We're going to go ahead and we're going to continue sharing that name. They had no idea how that day was going to go or how that meeting was going to end. They were committed and they were willing and they were in the process of sacrificing. Are we willing to sacrifice? If not, what stands in the way? Why would we not sacrifice? A lot of times that which stops us from sacrificing is, is actually an idol that we raise up. Some of us don't want to sacrifice because we're afraid. We're afraid of what might happen to us. And you see that that fear becomes an idol. And we maintain that fear. We, we maintain that idol. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to be ridiculed. We don't want to be one of, those, one of those religious, faithful people. We want to still have some fun. And you see, we, we maintain that idol in our lives. What idols do we need to get rid of, strike down, pull down? How do we need to commit ourselves to sacrifice? Submission, spirit-filled, sharing Jesus and the gospel clearly, being willing to sacrifice. Number five, we need to be strengthened. Say that with me. We need to be strengthened. If, if, if you're going to share Jesus one relationship at a time, if you're going to go uh, face-to-face, 
in conversation with these worldly bullies who are against the gospel, then you need the benefit. You need the benefit of other people to encourage you, to surround you, to listen to you, to remind you to persevere, to remind you that the best part is yet to come, the glory of heaven and the presence of, of our Father. You see in verse 23, when, when they were released, when Peter and John were finally released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. You see, they weren't alone they weren't by themselves. They were part of the body. You're a part of the body. There are some Christians who say, I just want to do life by myself. My relationship with God is personal. I am closest to God when I'm out in the woods sitting under a tree. Friends, that's not scriptural. We are called to do life together. We're called to share our struggles. We're called to share our joys. We bear one another's burdens. We need to, to strengthen one another. We listen to each other. We share with each other. We pray together. So who are your strengtheners? Who do you go to? Who do you check in with? Who is reminding you and calling you not to give up? Who is telling you that it's important to, to continue the conversation, to stay in that relationship? Who is reminding you that eternity matters? And similarly, who are you strengthening? You see, a lot of times we're all about receiving. But are we as equally given to contributing to the lives of others? Who are you strengthening? Who are you doing life with? Who are you checking in with? Who are you calling to persevere? Who are you praying over? Because every response matters. Responding to the bullies of this world also means, number six, we are going to sing and shout. Say that with me. We're going to sing and shout. When the believers met together for, for worship, they indeed had something to sing and shout about. They were not simply there to, to receive when they joined together in worship, but, but rather following the, the experiences of sharing Jesus and the gospel, they returned every single time with stories. They returned every single time with experiences and reports. They returned every single time with testimonies and lives in transition those who continue to reject, but those who are asking questions and those who, who had received and believed in the name of Jesus and were baptized. Whenever they came together, they had much to share as they recognized the faithfulness of God through it all. Amen, church? Look down at verse 24, please. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They were singing. They were shouting. They were confident in all that God had ordained. They were confident that God was continuing to unfold his good and his glorious plan as they were faithful to share Jesus one relationship at a time. Imagine how long this service would be if every single week we were coming back to this place and we had to go around the sanctuary to share where we've been and who we've talked to this week. 
of how we've, we've shared Jesus one relationship at a time. If we would tell the stories and, and share the testimonies and offer up names and lives and relationships and experiences, the hurts and the pains, the struggles and the addictions, the moments of darkness with which we have come face to face, and yet the victories and the celebrations, the confessions and the reaffirmations of faith, the dedications of lives to Jesus as Savior and Lord. If you're afraid this morning is going long, imagine what it would be like if we came back every single week actually fighting for pole position to share what the Spirit had done for the glory of God through our lives. How we would sing, how we would shout, and how the angels in glory would echo our worship. Can you say amen to that, church? One more. If we're going to be involved responding to those who, who are still bullies against the gospel, we need to know that such a response is always about sending to serve. Say that with me one more time. Sending to serve and it happens all over again, no matter what. We are sent out again to serve and to share Jesus with a world that will have various reactions this week. Looking down at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. As we prepare to bring a, a service of worship to a close this morning, there may be some of us checking our watches thinking, good, I am done with that. For another week, I'm all set to go. And yet there is nothing drawing to a close there is nothing done or completed. This is actually the very moment where we prepare to respond as God sends us out again to serve. And as he sends us, he fills us with the power of his Holy Spirit to speak words of life, to speak words of power, to speak words of truth that identify the best and the glorious will and plan of God and the life that is found in Jesus Christ alone. This is not a stopping point. This is where we are sent to serve. Who will go? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may the heart of every person here sacrificially be willing to go, not for us, but for Jesus. Because of everything that Jesus has done. May our lives never simply be an exercise in gathering for a short time. But may we be like Peter and John, 
that number of 5,000 so long ago. Again, we are not second string. We are not an afterthought. But we are the ones you have entrusted with the gospel to reach those you so love. Send us to serve, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.